Let's continue our look at the development of the atomic theory. J.J. Thomson was a professor at Cambridge University. He believed that the atom was made up of smaller particles, even though the scientists in his day believed that the atom was the smallest unit of matter. He discovered the first subatomic particle in 1896. He discovered the electron. He experimented with electrical currents passing through gases in a special sealed glass tube called the cathode ray tube. Scientists were working with electricity at that time, and it was long before they even understood that an electrical current was made up of electrons. This is a cathode ray tube. Scientists found that they could produce fluorescent radiation when they applied some voltage of electricity in the cathode ray tube, but no one knew how it worked. The cathode rays are invisible, but their movement can be detected because they cause substances such as glass to fluoresce or emit light. Thomson proposed that the radiation was composed of a stream of particles much smaller than the atom. To prove his theory, he exposed the cathode ray tube to a magnetic field. Cathode rays usually travel in straight lines. But when exposed to a magnetic or electrical field, Thomson found that they bent away from the negative. Since the rays were attracted to the positive and away from the negative, J.J. Thomson demonstrated that the rays consisted of negatively charged particles, which he called electrons. He was also able to measure the charge-to-mass ratio of the electron and found it to be the same no matter what gas was in the tube or what metal the electrodes were made from. 1.76 times 10 to the 8 coulombs per gram. Because it was known that the atom is electrically neutral, Thomson came up with the plum pudding model of the atom. In this model, the atom was essentially made up of positive charge in which an equal amount of negative charge was distributed. This is called the plum pudding model. The next scientist we will consider is Robert Millikan. In 1909, Millikan measured the charge of an electron by experimenting with negatively charged oil droplets in the famous Millikan's oil drop experiment. Small drops of oil with a negative charge were allowed to fall between two electrically charged plates. In a series of experiments, Millikan was able to measure the charge of an electron. He experimented with oil droplets passing through positively and negatively charged plates. Let's consider his experiment. In his experiment, a fine mist of oil was sprayed into the upper chamber with an atomizer. Some of the oil droplets fell through the hole in the upper floor, and Millikan was able to determine the mass of an oil droplet from its final speed while passing through the chamber. Next, Millikan used an X-ray source to ionize gas molecules in the chamber. Electrons from this process were absorbed by the oil droplets. This meant that the oil droplets now contained a negative charge. The negatively charged oil droplets were able to be stopped from falling by adjusting the voltage across the two plates. As the voltage across the plates was increased, the speed at which the oil droplets fell decreased. As the voltage is increased enough, some of the oil droplets actually moved upward towards the positive plate. And if the voltage was set just right, an oil droplet could be suspended mid-air between the two plates. In other words, 
the fall of charged oil droplets due to gravity can be halted by adjusting the voltage across two electrically charged plates, depending on the magnitude or size of the charge on the droplet. He calculated the charge on the drops to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Millikan took this to be the charge of a single electron. And once he knew the charge of an electron, he could use the charge to mass ratio determined by Thomson to determine the mass of an electron. He determined the mass of an electron to be 9.1 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. In 1909, Robert Millikan, working at the University of Chicago, succeeded in measuring the charge on the electron. He allowed a fine spray of oil to settle through a hole into a chamber where he could observe their fall. The top and bottom of the chamber consisted of electrically charged plates. He introduced a source of x-rays which can cause creation of charges when they strike matter. Charges produced by the x-rays attached to an oil droplet, producing one or more charges on the droplet. When there is no voltage applied, the fall of the droplets is determined by their mass and the viscosity of air through which they fall. When a voltage is applied, the droplets that have a negative charge will fall more slowly, stop falling, or even rise depending on the number of charges on them. By adjusting the applied voltage and observing the droplets both with voltage off and voltage on, Millikan was able to determine that the charges on the droplets were all multiples of a smallest value, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. He took this to be the charge on a single electron. Let's now consider the work of Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford studied radioactivity, and he discovered that there are three types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. Rutherford determined that each type of radiation differed in its response to an electrical field. Since the alpha particles were attracted toward the negative plate, they had to be positively charged. Remember, opposites attract. Since beta particles were attracted towards the positive plate, they had to be negatively charged. And since gamma rays were not affected, they had to be neutral. In 1910, Rutherford and his co-workers performed another experiment that led to the downfall of Thomson's model. In this experiment, Rutherford bombarded thin sheets of gold foil with high-speed alpha particles. Based on Thomson's plum pudding model of the atom, this picture shows what Rutherford expected would happen that all of the alpha particles would pass through the gold foil. Let's look at this diagram which depicts what Rutherford and his co-workers actually observed. Rutherford and his co-workers observed that almost all of the particles passed through the foil with little or no deflection. A few were deflected, some even bouncing back in the direction from which they had come. What Rutherford observed? He observed that nearly all of the alpha particles passed through with little or no deflection. Some alpha particles, however, experience slight deflections, a few experience severe deflections, and a similar amount did not pass through the foil at all, but bounced back in the direction from which they had come. In fact, only 1 in 8,000 bounced back. This means they must have hit something. Based on his results, Rutherford proposed a new model of the atom, 
a nuclear atom. In his experiment, Rutherford discovered the nucleus, a small, dense, positively charged central core of an atom. In Rutherford's nuclear atom, he proposed that the size of the positive charge in the nucleus is different for different atoms and is approximately one-half the atomic weight of the element. There exist as many electrons outside the nucleus as there are positive units in the nucleus. All of an atom's positive charge and most of its mass is located in the nucleus. In 1910, Rutherford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were scattered as they passed through a thin gold foil. Most of the alpha particles passed through undeflected. However, a few were found to be scattered at large angles, some even back in the direction from which they had come. This meant that they had collided with an object much more massive than the alpha particles themselves, yet so small that only a few alpha particles encountered them. This atomic level view shows what is happening. Most of the atom is occupied by the low mass electrons. The nucleus is small and massive. When an alpha particle encounters a nucleus, it is scattered at a large angle.